and E.M. Forster and Goldsworthy Lowe's Dickinson and Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein and the, what were then considered the progenitors and the big influences behind the Bloomsbury movement, and particularly with their cult of personal relations. Forster later, in, in one of his essays, got into some trouble for saying, if it came to, a, and this was in reference to some of his friends, the Apostles, which was a group of Cambridge intellectuals, um, some of whom were people like um, Guy Burgess, uh, who, of course, was one of the Cambridge spies, the, the, the traitors. If you, uh, um, Forster said, if it came to a choice between, between betraying my friend or betraying my country, I hope to God I would have the guts to betray my country. And it's that, the primacy, the high doctrine of friendship and personal relations and an absolute instinctive distrust of causes and the abstract that I thought was part of a Cambridge that went all the way back to Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley and, the, and not that I was religious but the, those who were martyred famously in Oxford. Cambridge produces martyrs and Oxford burns them. And um, <laughs> there is a martyr's memorial in Oxford to prove it. All the ones burnt there were Cambridge people. And, and, and it, 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 there was something about Cambridge that appealed to me. It was the, it was the mixture of rigour. I think after all the terrible things I'd done, um, the thieving and, the, you know, the, and the, the, the explosive disappointments of romantic love and, and physical love and all the other forms of love, agape and eros, um, uh, and I just thought that I needed the discipline and the restless intellectuality and the... Um, the, 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 the refusal to accept the world that Cambridge represented. Oxford represents the world, and always has. It's really extraordinary how, going all the way back throughout the history, that Oxford was a royalist stronghold and Cambridge was a Puritan stronghold. And there's nothing attractive about it. I'm, I'm not saying for a minute that Cambridge is more attractive. Uh, in many ways, it's less attractive. That Cromwell was a Cambridge man, you know, and, and Oxford was the capital of King Charles's Stuart cavalier, uh, you know, it was his citadel. Um, and then, as I say, also previously before that, the, the Cranmers and, the, and, and, and others. And all the way up, Robert Hewison wrote a very good book called Monty Python, The Case Against. Um, he wasn't presenting the case against it. He was merely recording the opposition to Python. But, and he writes a very good chapter about the, the tradition in Cambridge of long, lean, sarcastic Cambridge people, as opposed to short, dark, rather more friendly Oxford people. And you can see it in Beyond the Fringe, there's Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller, as opposed to Dudley Moore and Alan Bennett, who are lovely. How could you not love Alan Bennett? <laughs> and how could you not love Cuddly Dudley? And how would you not be scared by Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller? And then in the Python era, the same thing. You've got the lovely Michael Palin and the lovely Terry Jones, and you've got the incredibly sarcastic Eric Idle, Graham Chapman, and John Cleese. And he says, you know, the average Python meeting would be Terry Jones and Michael Palin saying, let's have some pantomime Princess Margarets. And John Cleese would go, why? <laughs> and <laughs> that, that tension, as it were, and, and actually you can even go further forward. You could say, well, Richard Curtis and Rowan Atkinson are a lot more lovable than that awful Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry, for example. <laughs> uh, dance. Darts! Oh, now you've got me going. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I, 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 a couple of Mondays ago, I, an ambition of mine was fulfilled. I, I sat next to Sid Waddell, who is the voice of darts, the, the, that Geordie commentator. Um, Tell us, the, Stephen, the, what he sounds like. Well, he said, total eclipse of the darts, he said at one point, which, which was very exciting. And I was able to come back with Bonnie Taylor because um, um, Phil Taylor is the, probably the greatest sportsman alive on the planet. You may question the use of the word sportsman next to a dance player, but um, he is 15 times world champion. He's broken every possible record. I don't think that any other sport in the world has a, has a, has a 15 times world champion. I find dance an absolutely captivating spectacle. And I think one of the things that's most captivating about it is this unspoken, or indeed sometimes quite boldly spoken fact, that people think there is a massive disconnect between someone like me enjoying uh, the gladiatorial arena of this extraordinary game, which is performed by rather tattooed working class people. And they therefore think either I'm being like some of those 
Regency bucks who used to beat up the watch and go, rah, rah, you know, how funny, let's watch some working class people beating each other to death. Um, or, or, or that I'm patronising, or that I'm trying to be cool. Or, but it is, it's nothing to do with that. There is this unwritten British embarrassment about the fact that dance is an, it's a pub game and it's a working class game and it is a very male game, it has to be said. But, and it's obviously not attractive to see large, overweight, sweaty men with tattoos, except for the fact that they are so good at their sport and the scoring of dance is so exciting that you get fantastic games. And I was able, as I said at the time, I, uh, on live television, so I had to be careful, I'm like a pig in Chardonnay. And um, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, <laughs> that's how I felt. Uh, I know it's odd, but there you are. Um, Martin Amis, uh, after all, uh, do you remember um, uh, uh, London Fields, uh, one of his very best novels, if not his best, I think. It's a really a marvellous book. He writes about darts really well. <laughs> Eros. Ian? Eros. Oh, Eros. Yeah. Oh, saw backwards by no, no accident. Um, <laughs> um, no, hang on. Um, <laughs> Um, it's also an anagram of Rose. Um, <laughs> too late. <laughs> too late, you're right. Um, yes. Um, when, when you're a child and you, you watch films on television, you, you, you tend to wonder why it is that the, the action, the comedy, the adventure stops every now and again for this bewildering, baffling nonsense that is eros, that is love. Um, and... Then, when you pass through childhood into adulthood, there's a part of you that sometimes questions why there is any other subject in the world. It is all there is to think about and talk about love. It is, of course, uh, everything within us. And it, the extraordinary thing about, and of course there are many shapes to it, the Greeks, uh, I, I, I alluded to a couple of them, agape and eros, but there's philos, and there, there are many others, Greek words for it. There, there are many nuances of, 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 of love. Um, and we know how important it is to us, and so much so that we don't even think about it, um, because um, because we, we sort of almost couldn't couldn't carry on living because of how important it is. And our dreams often tell us this. Uh, it's it's fascinating how how often one dreams about a moment of love or someone one has loved or, or lost or or unrequitedly loved um, will come back 30 years later, and you think, oh my God, I'm not still. Am I? I am. And I remember seeing a, a, a man of 106 being interviewed uh, on television on his 106th birthday. He was in, in Norfolk and he was the oldest man in East Anglia, which we were very proud of. And, uh, and the interviewer said um, he stands for something, not just a gay icon, not just a, uh, an alien in Irishman in England, not just a, a, a wit, not just a, an Eastie, not just a, a moral philosopher, a, a social and political commentator, a playwright, a, a poet, all the things he was, but somehow he, in his life and in the ruin of his life, in the terrible things that happened to him, the more you know about him, his kindness, his directness, his sweetness of nature, the more important he becomes, because there is no separation between his intellect and the way he treated people. And um, I just, uh, I think, the day I got bored of Oscar would, uh, would be the day that I became allergic to oxygen. It's just not thinkable. So I, I value him highly. Psychotherapy. <laughs> that's a good P, that. that's very good. <laughs> um, well, I think every, every day people are discovering new things about the brain. It is a cliche to say it's the undiscovered country within us. Um, and we know so little about it. It, 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 it would appear that the, the root of severe unhappiness is such as cause suicide or behavior so, so terrible, so unhappy for the individual and those around the individual uh, as to warrant sectioning and, and, uh, and s severe treatment, that the causes of those are still far from being understood, but they appear to be some mixture of 
the wiring, the neurology, if you like, the um, endo endocrinology, the, the, the hormones, the, you know, the, the, the well-known things like serotonin and dopamine and noradrenaline and you know, the encephalins and, and, and endorphins, um, and the physical synaptic pathways and other such things and the, the areas of the brain that are inhibited in growth by trauma, physical or mental. The, all these things come together in some way to alter, but uh, psychotherapy, um, of course, is easy to mock if you're British, um, partly because the only people you ever hear about who get psychotherapy are those who talk on television or people like me, and so you're bound to think psychotherapy is just something that rich celebrities do, like they might play polo or they might do this. So the first people we ever heard of who did psychotherapy were Woody Allen and John Cleese. But in the meantime, it's been given to hundreds of thousands of people who don't actually appear on talk shows and talk about it. So I think what's unfair sometimes is, is people thinking that it's just a, it's, it's a designer accessory of those in the public eye who can talk about how unhappy they are and uh, how miserable they are. Actually, if you've ever been to you know, take somewhere like Homerton, a place I've visited in the east end of London, you realize that mental health is almost like like drug dealing or anything else is essentially a problem for the homeless, the dispossessed, the immigrant, the uneducated, the, you know, the underclass, if you like. That is where real mental health, that's where the front line is. And, and um, so the, the, the idea that you can get up, get up and walk it off is, is, is mistaken. Thank you. <laughs> Q now, yeah. Q. Go on then. Q I. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to say queer. So, um, <laughs> right. Q I. Yes. Well, gosh. Um, it, it was the the brainchild of a man called John Lloyd, who is um, a remarkable fellow. He. Uh, he was also a Cambridge footlighter, but back in the same time as his friend Douglas Adams, and uh, he's, he started off doing radio comedy as a producer as a young man. Uh, he started the news quiz, for example, um, when, uh, and then he made the jump to television with uh, a show called Not the Nine O'Clock News, which I'm sure you'll remember, which made stars of Rowan Atkinson and Mel Smith and Griff Rees Jones and Pamela Stevenson. And, and, uh, and as the producer of that, he, you know, and also uh, Richard Curtis was the, the lead writer, as they say in America. Um, so it was a really talented bunch. He left, um, not, not nine o'clock news, after a relative number of series. And he and Rowan and Richard um, then produced Black Adder, uh, the, the first series of the Black Adder. Um, and then after that, he he did he created and devised and um, spitting image. Um, so he really is a sort of comedy god. Then um, I I'd sort of got to know him because you know, we had mutual friends and he asked me to be in Blackadder 2, which I was in. So I've sort of known him well since those days. That was in 1985, I think. Um, and then we went through quite a lot of Blackadders. And then at some point, when would it have been? In 2002, I suppose, or 2001 maybe, uh, he took me out to lunch and gave me this idea for a show, that, uh, which I think he already had the title, Q QI, for it, uh, about, uh, about things just being so interesting. And maybe if you could have a quiz show about the uni universe and history and people and things. And, and I particularly liked the idea, as I was beginning to get tired, as I'm sure we all are really, of, of television's incessant interest in popular culture and pop music and actors and actresses and in politics. I loved the idea of a quiz show that wasn't about the, the week's news, wasn't about Jordan, whoever she is, and, and it wasn't about Big Brother, and it wasn't about any of those things. It was an absolute free zone from any of that, but nor was it self-consciously about art and things. It was just about anything that was quite interesting. It's such a small and silly remit, but the, the, the title came about because he would say something, and someone would go, God, that's quite interesting. And you don't notice, you use the phrase a lot, right? Anyway, at the lunch, he said, uh, what, what do you think? I said, well, gosh, I'd love to be involved as long as I don't have to be the host. Because for some reason, I had this idea that being a host was a, was a miserable job. I think possibly because I'd been on, on uh, um, uh, uh, the news one. Um, have I got news to you? Why do I always forget its title? I always wanted to call it something anyway else. Um, 
and I always felt that Angus looked rather harassed, <laughs> and, and I thought it was much more fun being a guest. So I said, look, as long as I don't have to be the host. He said, no, that's fine. No, don't, you won't be the host. Um, so that was agreed, and <laughs> then he, he called me up and said, BBC are interested, and we're going to do a pilot. Charlie said, I can't find anybody to be the host, so for the pilot, would you be the host? <laughs> I said, oh, all right, if it's just for the pilot, I'll be the host. So we did a pilot, and then about three weeks later, he called up and said, there's really good news. I said, what is it? He said, the BBC love it. They want to do it as a series. I said, oh, hooray. He said, but on one condition. I said, oh. <laughs> so so I, I've been the host. And actually, I don't know why I was so against it. It's really good fun being the host. Uh, let's go with rolling. Oh, rolling, rolling, as in, as in JK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was a, this was a, again, it's one of these odd gigs you get. Um, many years ago, my agent called me up and said, as she might from time to time, oh, I know, she said, there's, a, there's an audio book. And I quite like doing audio books. It's really fun. I, I, you know, I often used to think before I, you know, had even got an equity card that if I was going to be an actor, even if I never really got any good parts, to read stories into a microphone would be terrific fun, and, what, and so I've always liked doing audiobooks. And she said, there's an audiobook, it's a children's one, and I thought immediately, oh, that's good, that'll be half a day, you know, because they're short. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and she, she, uh, she, said, uh, uh, she said, I've read it, I think it's rather good, you might enjoy doing it. I, I said, fabulous, send it over, and she sent it over, and it was, it was a novel, it was like, 90,000 words, like a, like, a, like a human novel. Um, and I was slightly startled, but I started reading it, and I thought, oh, this is fun, they're fun parts to play. So I, I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was jolly nice. So I turned up uh, uh, at the studio, and uh, at lunchtime, the author, this, this nice woman, Jo Rowling, turned up, we shook hands and chatted, and I, I, I wasn't really this patronizing, but it's better for the story if I was. I said, it's a jolly good story, it's very nice, and I'm enjoying it. Uh, and, and she said, oh, oh, I'm glad you like it, because I'm writing a second one. Are you? Good for you! Um, 